dynasty, we've now got a new dynasty founded by Prince Oranmian, who's Yoruba, who then <coughs> brings a whole bunch of Yoruba culture to Benin, and then this civilization blows up, as we shall see. Right now, this is a piece of Yoruba um, art, and again, it's metal. No, no, just sink in right there. That is metal. Okay, now it represents a guy called Oni Obalufon the second. And this particular guy is believed to be the father of Yoruba metal art. And then this technique is then brought to Benin and then enabled Benin to raise its game as a civilization. <laughs> now the civilization then thrives because of trade. That is supposed to represent a Hausa trader coming in from the north on horseback bringing goods to Benin and then eventually they would trade cloth, pepper and many other goods. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then we get links with Europe where they start trading via the Portuguese. Now, let's take a look at this. Anyone know what this is? It's a salt cellar. <laughs> yes, it's a salt cellar. <laughs> or as they say in the University of Oxford, a condiment bowl. <laughs> no, they say past the condiments, apparently. Right, now, three pieces of ivory, that bit there is one piece, second piece, third piece. Right then, this was made in the year 1500, all right? And you can compare this salt cellar with your salt cellar at home to find out how that has gone up, or it has gone down. <laughs> Right, now this is the group of people that you don't want to mess with, right? <laughs> now you notice that they're wearing body armour, yes? Yeah. Now this whole thing about body armour and chain mail and so on, we thought that Europeans came up with that. That just shows how little we know. Right, now, there's this concept, um, I live in Walthamstow, and there's this person in Walthamstow who used to live here called William Morris. And he founded something called the Art and Crafts Movement, yes? And they make a lot of noise about this. The idea that crafts have to be beautiful and practical, right? Now what you're looking at, that's um, again brass, yes? It's a chair. Now can you see there's a coiled snake, yeah? And can you see there's frogs on the base? That's Benin, Art and Craft. Now, unfortunately for William Morris, this was made in 1750. So in other words, William Morris is coming late. Yes. All right, arts and crafts again. This was made in approximately the year 1600. It's a drinking vessel, or to use polite language, simple language, a cup. Yes, it's about this big. And again, there's a bit that you can pour water into, it's a drinking vessel. Now you've never seen a drinking vessel quite like that, right? <laughs> again, the whole thing about the art and craft thing that William Morris is supposed to come up with, again, two words. My school students used to say, on that. And this is now the fam most famous piece of them all, the Queen Mother Head. Again, absolutely exquisite. Now you know why Benin art is considered as highly as it is. But this is, I'm about to drop two bombshells on you. This is the first one. Second one's coming. Right, Norris and Ross McWhorter, Guinness Book of Records, 21st edition, October 1974, page 129. The largest earthworks in the world carried out prior to the mechanical era were the linear earth boundaries of the Benin Empire, close brackets, Benin City, in the Midwestern, West, Midwestern state of Nigeria. They were first reported by modern European scholars in 1903 and partially surveyed in 1967. In April 1973, it was estimated by Mr. Patrick Darling that the total length of the earthworks was probably between 5,000 and 8,000 miles. Right, did you know that the city of Benin is in the Guinness Book of Records? Right, we know this now. Yes? Largest earthen works in the world. You heard that? Yes? You feeling that? Now you thought that I just dropped the bomb, didn't you? Didn't you? You thought I just dropped the bomb? Yeah. Now the bomb's coming. Deal with this. Jungle reveals traces of Sheba's fabled kingdom. A lost kingdom 
thought to be that of the fabled Queen of Sheba. No, it isn't. And possibly the earliest African city ever discovered. Not true. <laughs> has been found by a British archaeologist. He didn't find it. <laughs> but let's be, let's be quite clear what they're talking about. They're talking about a city. You heard that for a word. Yeah, yeah. Right, we'll read on. Mr. Patrick Darling discovered the site which covers more than 400 square miles. Mm -hmm. Did you hear what covers 400 square miles? Mm -hmm. What? A city. A city. Mm -hmm. Right, now let's get with this notion. A 400 square mile city. Are we feeling that? Yes. That is off the scale. <laughs> yeah? Now, modern London, I checked this, modern London inside the M25 is 600 square miles. But this is modern London. This is not modern. This is, when we read on, 1,200 years old. So in the year 800 AD, Africans built a 400 square mile city, the same size as two thirds of modern day London. Are we feeling that? Yes. yes. Now the whole point here is clearly, if Benin is in the Guinness Book of Records, that's just blown whatever record off the scale. <laughs> Enjoying that? Wow. This was found at a site in South Africa called Mapungubwe, and it's dated somewhere around the year um, 1085. Found in Mapungubwe. Now, what's interesting is it's a rhino made of gold. Yes, you can see that. But what's really interesting is is that the, the parts in South Africa and Zimbabwe where the gold mining was done the outcrop is granite. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Which means you're going to have to bore through granite to get at the gold. All right, okay. right? Now that then led to theories of how do you do that <laughs> without dynamite? Mm -hmm. Well, the only logical explanation is they must have used dynamite. Yeah. Yes? What's more, some of the mines are 150 feet deep. Mm -hmm. So how do you dig 150 feet through granite? Again, no theory has been forthcoming. And then two scholars, one was called Hall and the other one was called Neil, theorized, well, how much debris did they move? You waiting for this? Yep. They believe they moved 43 and a quarter million tons of ore. Mm -hmm. Now, we need to get with this notion. Yeah, yeah. Still your, car, <laughs> your car weighs three quarters of a ton. You understand that? Yeah. So one ton is more weight than your car. Mm -hmm. You follow me? Mm -hmm. Now, we didn't say 43 cars. You didn't hear that. You heard 43 million, mm -hmm. or to be exact, 43 and a quarter million tons of ore. That makes sense? Yeah. Which then, when you strip it down to pure gold, equals 700 tons of pure gold, equals, at 1998 gold prices, 7.5 billion US. Now that's what they shifted, not in the modern times, in the ancient times. Mm. Are we feeling that? Yeah, 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 come on. Yeah. Now based on that, they were then yeah. able to start living fat. <laughs> right? <laughs> and what we're seeing here is 12 buildings spread out over three square miles. So you can see walling going on here, walling going on here, walling going on here. Now, this is the point, because the walls are le less tall than the trees, most people are thinking, oh, that's not very tall. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you're assuming these are ordinary trees, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> now, why would you be assuming that? We're we feeling that. Yes? Now, we're getting some idea of scale here. All right, now, this is the capital city of the Southern African kingdoms and eventually it grows into an empire. The city is called Great Zimbabwe. And then, check pattern, dental pattern, chevron pattern. In other words, you can then teach an architecture class just using these walls. Right, there's the, that's one of the doorways into the Great Zimbabwe complex. Right, now, are we enjoying that? Now, can you see the trees compared to the gentleman? 
Right, now that's why I say not ordinary trees, mm -hmm. yes? Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting about the entire building complex is that no mortar and no lime has been used to join yeah. the bricks. Mm -hmm. In other words, this is what's called dry stone walling. Mm -hmm. And then you can see the chevron patterns along here. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Now, notice the chevron starts here and goes through and ends at one particular point. Now, why does it do that? <laughs> Right, inside the complex. Now, it's a shame that there's nobody in the picture giving us some idea of scale, but I can correct that. <laughs> right, that's what it's believed to have looked like. Now, my man on the left with the um, boxer shorts here, <laughs> yeah, that's not authentic dress, yeah? I bought this picture from Mambo Press, and whereas the rest of it is happening, what my man's wearing is not happening. Yeah? When you read the accounts of what people were wearing, they would have worn uh, what's called untailored clothes. Untailored basically means toga. You know the kind of toga thing that you see the shanties wearing? They would have been wearing that too. And they would have had ones where you had gold stitching being stitched through mm -hmm. the, the cloth. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then they would be held with rosette patterns, which would be these floral patterns. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, the, the person that drew this hadn't read that, because had they read that, they would have. Um, made my man a bit more stush for the occasion. <laughs> right, now, you enjoyed that? Right then, now one of the rulers of Great Zimbabwe conquered a large chunk of southern Africa and then built the empire of Monomotapa. Now, Africans say Monomotapa. Europeans say Monomotapa. So this is what's here. Let's read it. Le Grand Roy Monomotapa, the great king of Monomotapa, with his crown, with his scepter, with his cape. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now that's how they would have been stepping. <laughs> now, what empire did they build? Let me show you something. M O N O M O T A P A. Monomotapa. Can you see it's all this? Okay. Right, now, if we look at this, objectively, that's somewhere between, what, a quarter to a third of Africa, mm -hmm. yeah? In other words, about the same size of territory as what the emperor of the world, Emperor Tahaka, <laughs> had going on. Now, what's really interesting about this map is, this here, Zimbabwe, see that? That's Zimbabwe, making quite clear that was the old capital. Now, the Empire of Monotapa is Zimbabwe, which was its center, Mozambique, South Africa, at least as far as Johannesburg, Botswana, and a bit of Angola. In other words, it was massive, one of the largest political units the black race has ever produced. Does that make sense? Yeah. And they founded this empire somewhere around the year 1100, and they held it intact right up until 1629. 1629 is when it was all over, when the empire was then destroyed by Portuguese slave raiders. Right, now, can you see there's somebody in the picture? Now, had that person not been there, you wouldn't know how big that was, would you? Right then, now decorating these monuments are these soapstone sculptures. And these soapstone sculptures, they represent birds, and some people say, wait a minute, isn't that a little bit like the falcon thing in Egypt? Mm -hmm. Yes, and that kind of discussion has happened. Now these soapstone things, they're now on the money. You know in Zimbabwe? Mm -hmm. They're now symbols on the money, mm -hmm. making it quite clear that people is using their history. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. Right, now, this is the city of Kami. Now, doesn't that look like something out of Milton Keynes? <laughs> doesn't look like Milton Keynes? I grew up in Milton Keynes. Trust me, that looks like Milton Keynes. <laughs> Meaning, again, modernism. Mm. Even though this is the medieval world. Mm -hmm. Right then, now. <laughs> <laughs> Right now, the whole point, people ask me, Robin, why is any of this stuff relevant? <laughs> now, can you see that if that's the alternative, we need to get with our history? <laughs> now, a lot of people want to um, blame black youngsters for gun crime and other things. 
Remember, black youngsters are only a reflection of black elders. Mm -hmm. So if there's gun crime, black elders can't say it's not their fault. Mm -hmm. It is their fault. Mm -hmm. Yes? Now, it's not just youngsters where there's a problem where we need to be getting with our history. Check some before and afters. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, serious. <laughs> oh dear. Right. Now, the before and afters, this is what happens when people don't know their history. And if you don't know your history, if you don't think your history is relevant, then you'll end up doing all sorts of negative things to yourself mm -hmm. to try and look like some other group of people. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas, you don't need to be doing that. Yeah. That's right. Now, just to bring the history relevance, problem 24 in the Rhine Papyrus, by which the problem is solved by means of an unknown quantity, aha. This is the earliest example of algebraic procedure. Right, did we know then that black people invented algebra? Mm -hmm. There's the proof. And therefore, if people knew their history, if people knew that their history was relevant, then they wouldn't want to be trying to aspire to be somebody else. Mm -hmm. That's right, that's right. Yes. Right, the calibration of the Karnak water clock. Right, let me explain this. Okay. Right, what's going on here? There's a water clock where if you look at the inside of it, we've got it divided up into 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 months. Right? And then at certain points of the month, the days get longer and shorter. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And therefore, the calibration of the holes is different. So each hole is one hour. So you get it? So when you fill it, there's your first hour, second, mm -hmm. third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh. You follow me? Mm -hmm. And then by the time it runs out, 12 hours. Mm -hmm. So we've got 12 hours of the night is what this actually represents. Mm -hmm. Now, the idea of the hour, that's an African concept. Mm -hmm. We invented that. The mm -hmm. concept of time is an African concept. Mm -hmm. We invented that. Mm -hmm. So we've got the concept of numbers mm -hmm. and algebra. We've now got the concept of time. Mm -hmm. And then when you put the two concepts together, you can then start mapping the heavens. And mapping the heavens gives you the notion of the year. Now, this is important because this is on the, um, what they call it, ceiling of a monument called the Temple of Dendera. And on the Temple of Dendera, let's look at some details we see here. Here we see what's clearly Sagittarius. See that? Mm -hmm. See this? Mm -hmm. Leo, see that? What else can we see? Two fishes. Pisces. Yes? And then we can then go on pointing out this or that, yeah? Now what's the really interesting one? This one right here. Yes? Cancer. But it's not a crab, it's a dung beetle. Because of course, Europe is what turned it into a crab because they don't have dung beetles. The fact that that's a dung beetle, proof, yes? Africans came up with this. Mm -hmm. And this concept here, the, the 12 signs of the zodiac becomes the 12 months of the year. Mm -hmm. And then later religions will turn it into the 12 tablets of Gilgamesh, which is what the Sumerians were running with. The 12 labors of Heracles <coughs> is what the Greeks were running with. You follow me? Mm -hmm. And then certain religions then turn it into 12 tribes of this, 12 disciples of that. Are we feeling this? Yes. Mm -hmm. Right, now we have, you know the whole thing about us above, so below? Mm -hmm. Right, let me explain this. When Christopher Columbus was running up his mouth about having <laughs> discovered the Americas, a Turkish admiral called Piri Reis realized then, as most of the Islamic world did, Columbus is a fraud. And my man didn't just say Columbus is a fraud, he proved Columbus is a fraud. And the way he did it is that he assembled maps that go all the way back to the Alexandrian period of Egypt. And then once he assembled those maps, he then published the composite map. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, can you see that's the coast of Africa? Where's this? That's Brazil, surely. Mm -hmm. Where's this? Mexico. Mm -hmm. These islands here, where are they? The Caribbean. So here we see South America, Brazil and so on, has already been mapped. Are we feeling this? Yeah. Mexico and those places have already been mapped. Now you'll see that the map tears at this point. Right? And then the research went to 
a cartographer at um, the University of New Hampshire. The cartographer's name was Professor Charles Hapgood. And then Hapgood and his students, they worked on this map to work out where was the geodetic center of the map. That makes sense? Because the map's torn. So you have to use what's there to work out where the center of the map would be. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Have a guess where the center of the map is. It is Africa. It's the Egyptian Nubian border. Oh dear. That means that whoever was responsible for mapping this, they were standing on the Egyptian Nubian border. Yes? Right, now we talked about the mapping of the heavens, we talked about the mapping of earth, now we're going to talk about the mapping of inside a person. Right, there's a scholar called Naim Akbar, and he's one of our best um, psychologists. And he studied ancient Egyptian concepts and realized that the Egyptians had not just worked out advanced ideas in psychology, their ideas were so advanced that modern psychology is not caught up with where they were at. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, let me explain it. Here we've got you some Egyptian concepts of the soul. Now, let me introduce the discussion. If I was to deal with what makes a human being a human being, most of us would say, um, well, if you cut your arm off, you're still you. <laughs> if you cut your second arm off, you're still you. If you cut your legs off, you're still you. So there comes a point where it's not you. And where it's not you is when you lose your personality. That's what most people would think. <laughs> Meaning that a human being is part physical, part personality. Or to use the Descartian sense, part mind, part body. Now when Descartes said that, everyone said, yeah, yeah wicked would idea. <laughs> Not realising that this was about to be dug up. And when this was dug up, they found out that the Egyptians divided people into Ka, yeah. Ba, Kaibit, Ab, Kat, Sahu, Ku. That makes sense? Yeah. So what? Once you know that the car is the person's spirit, mm -hmm. that's one aspect of a person. Mm -hmm. Bar, that's the person's personality. That's the second aspect of a person. Kaibit, this is the person's shadow. That's the third aspect of a person. Ab, that's the person's heart. That's the seat of consciousness. I mean, from a point, conscience, mm -hmm. because that's what gets heavy when you do something wrong. Mm -hmm. Then you've got the cut, that's your physical body, that's what stays right here and is recycled with all the elements like everything else. Then you've got the sahu, which is in the heavens, your double. And then you've got your ku, which is the heart of the double. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now can you see that's blowing mind and body out of the water? <laughs> now this is the point. Once we accept that a human being is all of these elements, yeah? Therefore, spirituality has a scientific purpose. And that scientific purpose is to unify these different selves into a coherent one. Now we have a working definition of mental illness. Mental illness is where these are not coordinated. Does that make sense? Now, who came up with this idea? Us, thousands of years ago. And we can use it if we know our history. Right, Sheikh Kanta Diop says, the Af African history proceeded without interruption. The first Nubian dynasties were prolonged by the Egyptian dynasties until the occupation of Egypt by the Indo-Europeans starting in the 5th century BC. Nubia remained the sole source of culture and civilization until about the 6th century AD. And then Ghana seized the torch from the 6th century until 1240 when its capital was destroyed by Sunjata Keita. This heralded the launching of the Mandingo Empire of Mali, Next came the Empire of Gao, Songhai, the Empire of Yatenga in today's Burkina Faso, and the kingdoms of Jolof and Kayo, Senegal, destroyed by Fade Herb under Napoleon III. In listing this chronology, we wanted to show that there was no interruption in African history. It is evident that, if starting from Nubia and Egypt, we had followed a continental geographical direction such as Nubia, Gulf of Benin, which is what we did, Nubia, Congo, Nubia, Mozambique, which would take us to Mutapa, which is what we did. Yeah. The course of African history would still have appeared to be uninterrupted. This is the perspective in which the African past should be viewed. Mm -hmm. People want more? There it is. Mm 